Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Mental Health. I'm Nels Kloster, and I'm an addiction psychiatrist who works in southern Vermont. Uh, my name is Robert Stack, and I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor and a licensed mental health counselor. Yeah. Good evening. And just to remind people if, to send us uh, your questions or to, to view previous episodes at uh, www.facebook.com uh, backslash Let's Talk VT, or to send questions, uh, email us at questions at Let's Talk VT.com. Okay. Um, one other announcement. If you send an email question to let's talk Vermont at gmail.com, we never received it. Uh, we don't own that uh, address. So please, please, if you have sent a question in, uh, I'm going to ask you to resend it to questions at let's talk Vermont.com. It's right on the bottom of the uh, email. Um, the other address, I think, is a dating service, so that might be yeah. helpful. But we don't want to get connected no, with but, that. No. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we did, we did but quite we a did few questions <laughs> on, the, on, the, on, the, on the postcards that uh, maybe people have seen around town. So that's, uh, we probably won't get to all of these tonight, um, so we'll have to say some of them for a, a future that's episode, right. most likely. And, well, I was just going to mention, next week we're going to have David Gardenstein on as a guest. Right. And uh, we've been trying to have, we had a... Uh, 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 Staley, the superintendent. Right, Ron Staley. Ron yeah. Staley was on, and, and we had Mike Fitzgerald uh, a couple weeks ago. And and now we're going to have David Gardenstein, who's yeah. the state's attorney, and ha he, he's willing to come on and talk with us. So yeah. that will be next week. So I'm really looking forward Good. to that. If anybody has any questions they'd like yeah. to ask the state's attorney, specifically around addiction and alcoholism and mental illness and courts, yeah. uh, please send that in, and uh, we'll we'll include it in the program. All right. Good. As long as hey. it's civil. Absolutely. And, but I mean, know. sort of, we've been looking at people who head up some very important institutions around town right. that are a very important part of town life. So it's been really wonderful to have their perspectives. And, and one of the things that we've been after also talking about was, you know, having people in the future on, uh, maybe some people who are working in the field. Uh, you mentioned yeah. um, Turning Point. Um, right. Maybe the director of Turning Point would be a good guest. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, well, th that will be coming up in the next year, but okay. we're working on it. We're working we'll on it. it. Yeah, we'll get around. Yeah. So the first question we have: uh, Can hypnosis be used for addiction? And what's the difference between uh, what's the treatment difference for heroin versus cocaine? All right. So there's two separate questions right. there. I say. Yeah. I mean, do you have any experience with hypnosis, Robert? No. Uh, have you un gone under it or no, used it? No, I avoid things like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it's a pretty controversial treatment from uh, you know, what I've seen about it, uh, whether it's actually an altered state of mind, whether people actually um, go under a trance, uh, whether sort of tapping into, uh, I won't say hidden powers, but sort of acknowledged uh, powers that we have about uh, you know, positive uh, self-thinking. We have another question tonight talking about the placebo effect, and uh, I hope we get to it. But um, I have heard some people say it's been helpful in quitting smoking. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I mean, anecdotally, you hear about people who hypnosis has been helpful for. So I don't want to make, you know, deny that. But the only research, the actual research that I've seen, like in, in, in my, you know, uh, counselor magazine or the Times or whatever, it doesn't seem hypnosis works well for. Uh, addiction right. or alcoholism. At least I've, nev I've not seen any studies that indicate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I, I try and stay up on that. So Yeah, no, like you, I think for uh, quitting smoking, that's the thing I've heard it works most for. Maybe some people talked about doing well with uh, weight loss and hypnosis. But I, I think what strikes me is that with hypnosis, you know, maybe it's a starting point for some people, mm -hmm. sort of making a commitment to some change. Uh, but that the long I haven't seen anything about long-term effects around things like smoking and, and weight loss. I think, like many things we look at, um, it's not necessarily this big hoorah in the beginning as it is sort of sustained effort and attention that really helps you to, to quit something or to helps you to become more healthy. Yeah. So I think that's an important piece uh, you know, that needs to be incorporated, whatever you're trying to do to get yourself to make some changes. And it's not that... Uh we don't want to spend a lot of time on it because the other yeah. question is pretty important. But I'll just say, yeah. you go all the way back to the 1800s, and that's the beginning of psychiatry and psychology in some way, yeah. the original 
Well, that's what they doc, were doing. Was Doctor Doctor Mesmer? Mesmer, and that's his right. idea he worked with so we say state state hospital type patients, and this very intense. I'm not even trying to, 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 to mimic, but a very yeah. intense gaze, almost sort of like animal training, and you know uh, right. the, the lion tamer in the in the circus, that he thought by the power of his sort of internal will coming out through his gaze that he could mesmerize that's patients right. and and enact change. But that then that that also that whole work got Freud interested in the, in the, in the subconscious, in the unconscious. Is yeah, that right? Is I'm that, not sure. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I mean, just the whole idea of taking a look at what was available in the mind and what you could do. So anyway, so it's not that strange of a question. I mean, yeah. it's very valid. I mean, it's part of yeah. the... It's been, been around for a long time. That's right. So, yeah. But let's go to that next one. So it's like the treatment differences in heroin for heroin versus cocaine, which is... Yeah, interesting because right there's certain elements of addiction treatment that are similar across whether you're talking about you know yeah, a drug is a drug is a drug so mm -hmm. whether you're treating alcohol dependence cocaine uh, issues uh, opiate uh, dependency there's certain things that are very important like changing the people places and things you know the, the counseling components um, but then when you look at sort of other treatments um, for example with with heroin we have methadone, we have suboxone, so we've been able to uh, use medications that work in the opiate receptors, the methadone and suboxone, which then cease the cravings, take away with the withdrawal, and allow people to more easily engage in the work of counseling, you know, changing the various aspects of my life that have been, uh, you know, d altered or even destroyed from, from my addiction. And so people have tried to do the same thing for cocaine, and it's just not worked. Uh, the idea being that, you know, the way cocaine works is your one nerve synapse will release dopamine. And then it's a natural part of the, 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 the brain system to then sort of vacuum that back up and put it back in the nerve synapses. And cocaine works by blocking that act of vacuuming it back up. So the idea was that uh, since dopamine's affected with this, maybe there's some medications that affect the uptake of dopamine that we could use then to decrease the urge for cocaine. And uh, for example, so well, butrin does this, it's a dopamine you know, reuptake inhibitor. And while people looked at these mechanisms and thought, yeah, theoretically, that sounds really great, none of it's panned out in, uh, in, in treatment. Right. Yeah. I, and you know, it's interesting, and I'm glad you mentioned it earlier about methadone and suboxone. And, uh, you know, there was a time when the real treatment for almost all drug use was abstinence. Right. I mean, whether it be alcohol or it be but cocaine, you just stop using. Now, you know, they would make recommendations. They would make recommendations whether it be a therapy or treatment or whatever, but, and sometimes use of medications. But I'm not... I'm not clear about any medications that have been proved to be helpful, and I, did, I don't know if you mentioned you mentioned the vaccine, like the, right? That they tried to do down in Yale. Yeah, um, some people, yeah. The, then, the idea that, um, and again, cocaine is a very small molecule, so that's why it passes through the blood-brain barrier to have the impact that it does. So what they've tried to do is to take a common cold virus and attach a uh, molecule that mimics cocaine, and then put that into the in, into the into the body and then develop antibodies that attack that common cold virus which most of us have but then also there gets to be this this recognition or antibodies that then can uh, attack the cocaine and so then what happens the idea is that you take this vaccine you introduce these uh, this this mimic then you develop antibodies so you take cocaine then it gets sort of gobbled up by the antibodies before it gets a chance to pass into the blood through the blood brain barrier to get into the brain to then stop the the vacuuming up of, of dopamine it, it's it cocaine's interesting and just from and I have to acknowledge a lot of my experience in 29 years or whatever was in a hospital so I met with a very select population of folks but even even within people I knew socially and stuff cocaine was readily available at one point a lot of people were doing it it's fairly common drug uh, and it was one of these drugs that I thought a lot of people just stopped using mm -hmm. I mean, it was really a decision not to use anymore, go through thousands of dollars or whatever. And yet I've also worked with clients who got involved with something like um, crack cocaine. And they, they talked about a compulsion that was really 
uh, out of control. They would lose two or three days. And I, I'm, you know, I'm talking about folks that worked and jobs and nurses, all kinds of folks, so all walks of life. And again, it's that same thing that there are some people who can drink a lot of alcohol and yeah. never become alcoholics. Right. There are people who can do lots of cocaine and have done lots of cocaine and never get to that point where it becomes right. what, you know, what I would see yeah. as addiction, as that place where it becomes so harmful. And, and you know why that is, and you, if you went completely to the nurture argument, you know, well, it's, it has to do with who they are and their struggle in life and everything, you know, you know, and you start talking about the underprivileged and whatnot, you say, well, they're, they're victims, right? And they're victims of society and they find relief in cocaine, you know. But I know people who are not victims and they're right. not victims of anything. Yeah. And they got involved with cocaine and just couldn't stop. And so I, I think cocaine is a really good example in my mind, anyway, of um, how, how you can, it isn't the amount that you use the drug almost, it was, it, it was really like how the drug acts in you, what it does for you as an individual. Uh, and I, right, I like don't you, know if that's biology or what it yeah, is, but yeah. it's really clear. I, I've been able to see it firsthand. Uh, people who have used um, lots of cocaine just walk away from yeah. it, don't use it, you yeah. know, not well, part like, of their life. Like you said before, there's nothing inherently bad about the alcohol in the bottle of wine. It's what happens when it gets in the body and that reaction that happens. <clears throat> And you know, as you said, I mean, there are, there's no medic, there, there's no drug out there that is so powerfully addicting that uh, one try of it has you hooked for life. So, like I said, people have walked away from cocaine just like people who will uh, have abused alcohol and say they're early 20s. That doesn't mean they become dependent on it. You know, how do we tell who that is? You know, we're really, we're still working on that, right? Genetics and, and yeah, and when they did studies, a lot of times that they would use cocaine because there was no withdrawal. Uh, you know, alcohol is a withdrawal, and heroin right. is a withdrawal. You're sick, and that increases the cravings and stuff. So, uh, with cocaine, there's no withdrawal effect in you. Though some people yeah. say there's a psychological withdrawal. Yes, they try to say it wasn't a physiological addiction; it, it was, was a, a psychological, psychological addiction. And yeah. then, if they were on a long run of using coke, they can really get depleted and be in, be in uh, yeah. psychological problems. And occasionally, I remember, and this is why I I mentioned my uh, I had this extensive experience in a very small arena. Um, not all coke people would get, they wouldn't come in the hospital for detox. In other words, since I worked on a detox unit, I saw a lot of people there for detox, whether it be alcohol or opiates. Uh, so I didn't see a lot of people who were there for uh, any kind of detoxification from cocaine. Uh, occasionally it was a psych problem or something else was involved. So. Um, I. Again, you know, if, if I knew somebody was in trouble with cocaine, I would recommend NA to them. And if they used to drink, and a lot of people drank with coke. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, a good sign of an alcoholic is that if you ask him if he does coke, he goes, yeah, I do coke so I can drink more. So you can drink more, yeah. So I can yeah. drink more. That's a good... Right, yeah. <laughs> and they do. They, the molecules combine in a way to sort of modulate the impact of each of them and sort of let the whole the thing whole, whole ride thing a little on. bit longer, yeah. So, uh, you know, again, I mean, I think... It, the change in treatment, I just want to make sure that we get this right, about the treatment difference for heroin and yeah. cocaine. I mean, both of them, you know, you recommend abstinence, most, you know, yeah. uh, and then from there you want to look at support systems, um, you know, change of lifestyle, 12-step programs involvement, outpatient, and where appropriate and necessary, uh, medication, whatever right. that medication Whether for, is. for depression or some other issue that right. uh, might impact you, right. Right. So yeah. I, I don't know if that... Well, in a way, that question, you could almost uh, say for uh, cocaine, you have to do it the old-fashioned way. There's none of those sorts of, uh, you know, options with uh, medications assisting people's recovery like there is with opiate dependency. Not that I heard. Like I said, there was this uh, the, uh, vaccine study that started, I think it started at Yale, and it went into, there were some side effects or something. I forget the yeah. whole story, and I think it's another hospital in the Midwest is now running it. Yeah. Um, but that, that's all I yeah, really yeah. know it, about. Yeah, a fascinating concept, but a lot of a lot of hurdles. Know. And I, I don't know. I guess I'm so far removed from the day-to-day -day drug culture. I don't even know how much cocaine is out there. But I was reading an article in the Times yesterday about a woman who became addicted to heroin on Staten Island, and her drug of choice was coke. And then yeah. she couldn't find coke, and the person she went to visit had heroin, and anyway, she ended up doing it. But. Yeah. 
Uh, again, I don't, I don't know how much it is part of entertainment or part of the restaurant business or part of the. Yeah. Uh, at what uh, point yeah. it was it was everywhere. I mean, I, mean, I know, know that you know regionally in Massachusetts has been more of an issue, say with methadone clinics and other substance use, that uh, cocaine has been more of an issue with uh, clinics in Massachusetts, and then here in marijuana. I mean, here in Vermont, not surprisingly, marijuana is the most common. Uh, Code. Illicit or other substance that, that we see with our patients. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So the next question is perfectionism and addiction. How about workaholism? <laughs> yeah, how, how hard do you work, Robert? Yeah, uh, no, yeah. I don't work at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that, you know, we talked about this last week. You know, we, we don't want to make uh, everything a disorder, we don't right. want to make everything an illness. And God forbid that people work hard. Uh, but I do know what they mean, and, and again, if you want to look into it, I worked with some alcoholics who were uh, perfection, and I worked. With, I remember one guy I worked with; he was obsessive compulsive. I right. think he met the criteria for obsessive compulsive personality. Personality disorder. Sort of, okay. I think so, and he ended up in quality control, which was a perfect oh, yeah. place for him, you know. Yeah. But, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't play well with others. That's right. And that's very right. precise, and, and, and it's got to be a certain way, which, again, a disorder maybe, maybe makes for difficult relationships, but man, he could find a job it, that he could excel at. He did well. And not only that, but he actually got into, he stopped drinking, and, and he got into yeah. bodybuilding and, and getting his body perfect and, you know, okay. weight right and everything. And he was a good fellow. I mean, I liked him. I mean, yeah. uh, but I don't think any of those are really disorders. I don't think any, I yeah. mean, I, I might be wrong. I mean, I mean, I, uh, exactly. I mean, if I, I was, I was again, I mean, from our conversation last week when we were talking about a sort of way of classifying what could be very well natural processes and calling them disorders, seems to have gone over the top. Uh, for example, seeing if, um, you know, I spend all my day pursuing, you know, cocaine or heroin, then, you know, that idea of sort of pursuing and seeking that thing, that, that's an addiction. Whereas if uh, I spend all day long playing the piano, uh, I'm called an artist instead, yeah, yeah, right? I might yeah. not have relationships. Uh, it, it impacts my, my well-roundedness. I maybe even get sort of, uh, you know, physical effects of that, but I'm, I'm called an artist as opposed to an addict. So a lot of this, again, not trying to suggest that people give up that they're the same thing, but there's a lot of similarity there that ties into our human nature of, of sort of seeking and striving and deriving pleasure from something. I also, if you don't mind, one of the things that you can look at these is is what what is going what is going on in involved with someone who's working all the time? Uh, for instance, I knew someone who really felt, and this came out in a men's group. I was working in a men's group, and we were talking about it, and I followed up with this one individual, and he talked about he would never get high and do drugs at work, and mm -hmm. and and he was very he felt good at work. He knew what he was yeah. doing. He was very competent at work. He was respected at work. I mean, it was sort of like, and he defined himself by his work. Yeah. Uh, and you know, if, when you meet somebody, you find out their name, and the second yeah. thing you say, what, what do you do? do? You know? What do you do? Yeah. And that, that was really his image of himself. And so I think he, but he didn't feel good about himself as a father. And he, his own father being an alcoholic, he didn't know how to be a good father. He knew how, not, how to be a bad father, yeah. but he didn't know how to be a good father. And he didn't know what he was doing most of the time on intimacy, uh, relationships. And so I think in some ways, I, I mean, you know, you, people do things that they're good at. And they like to do what yeah. they're good at. And they don't like doing things that they're not good at. And so I think some people get, if you were working with somebody and they told you they were a workaholic or whatever, that, you know, and there's probably a reason for that. I mean, there's probably something else, and that might be why they're sitting there talking to you, is the other thing. It's not so much that I work so much, it's really, you know, why are you working so much? What is that doing for you? What, you know, what, what, what is the benefit that you get? And part of the benefit is that you don't have to participate in life. Yeah. Uh, I think it's true, you know, for me, I, I, you know, I love to read. I think sometimes when I spend all my hours reading, it just means I don't have to be present. Right. You know, I'm in this make-believe yeah. world. I read books, and I, you know, that's, yeah. I go there. I get it. Yeah. I that's mean, what I, I loved when I had the kids and read stories to them. I was like, I kind of like going back into this world. Uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking too, though, people. Uh, there's, there's sort of this 
classification of things called process addictions right. too. Uh, so again, when you talk, we talk about substances like you know alcohol, opiates, and cocaine. Those are things that we can look at and, and touch. People then talk about sort of this, uh, maybe perfectionism, work alcoholism, but uh, you know, sex addiction, gambling addictions, as this thing that we can't stop doing. So it has the same idea of being being compulsive, this sort of seeking of this pleasurable activity, either through pleasure or out of anxiety, being engaged in that, which is very similar, but seems to well. It might be different because it responds differently to treatments, a little more difficult. I mean, there are 12-step groups, there are no medications. So uh, the jury's, I think, still out on whether that's a whole different sort of category of, uh, of addiction or even addiction, these sort of process issues. And that, that issue about being perfect, I, I, I am so far removed from being perfect, like I, I really shouldn't even talk about it. I mean, I don't, you know, I sort of know I'm flawed. But our, our producer, when they saw that question, she said she, she reacted to it and said, you know, it is one of the things that, that young women struggle with. And okay. I, I imagine maybe young boys too, but yeah. the idea that they have to have the right clothes, they have to be, right. be you know, wearing the, look the right way. Right. The, right, the, the right, right shape, thing. the right, right weight, shape, and those all sorts of things. And then yeah. I, you know, and I want to validate that. I mean, I, don't, I didn't mean to downplay that. I, I, I just didn't think of it that way. You yeah. know, I was thinking about somebody who is sort of, everything has to be a certain way. Yeah. But I guess when you start talking about your own personal appearance and about who you are and the way people see you, I, that might be, uh, um, well, it, it, it might be an issue about when, I don't know this, and I'm really on thin ice here, but when you talk about eating disorders, when you talk about things like that and how people perceive how they look and stuff, I mean, maybe that's part of that. I'm not sure about that, though. I mean, really. I, I, um, anyway, I just wanted yeah. to say that. Okay. Yeah, or at least being far from perfect and that, that feeling of, yeah, can't well, be we're, right. Or worrying about not being uh, yeah. imperfect. And I can remember being an adolescent and just, you know, worrying about my ears were too big or, you know, my... Yeah. You know, it, you know, it wasn't yeah. quick enough or whatever. You know, you always have some problem that you worry about yeah. how you look and go well, to. Well, we were talking before the show that part of the, the maturing process is realizing can't do that anymore, can't do that, <laughs> I'm not going to be that. So it's, it's, it's letting go of things. Yeah. Uh, which, again, you know, when you have this kind of compulsion, it's very hard to let go of. Right, but I wouldn't, I, and I hope that's all right that we just say that. I wouldn't call it a mental illness. I wouldn't call it a mental disorder. It, it might be a trait. It might be an indication of some yeah, other yeah. problems, some other issues and stuff. But I wouldn't yeah. go so far. I, I, you know, you want to be careful about making a diagnosis yeah, yeah. because somebody likes to do things right or somebody yeah. wants to work a lot. Exactly, and we... we and two, we admire these traits when they're in highly accomplished people, whether it's successful business people or whether it's uh, famous artists. The idea of this uh, never-ending drive for perfection and quality and, and being demanding is something, again, in a different cultural context, we say, wow, that's really a good thing. But remember, their family members may not think that well of their behavior. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, yeah. if you thought about family members who are involved with people who are everything that you just said, they might yeah. feel neglected. They might feel yeah. that it's yeah. not pleasant living with the... There have been some famous exposés written by the family yeah. members. That's yeah. right. So I guess that, and that would be the issue. I mean, that would be the issue is the interpersonal relationships and how does it affect them? And, yeah. uh, you know, maybe that's more of the problem than what the person is doing. Yeah. All right, I'll stop. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so next question, what is the placebo effect? Can the mind really take care of mental illness? Boy, that's, Yeah. I, I like this. Yeah. Um, Again, you know, when you mentioned, when we, we reviewed the questions, obviously, before the show, we were talking about it, and, and I, I, I really like the idea, you know, I mean, I wonder if we shouldn't use the placebo effect first, you know, yeah. like, you know, well, give everybody... We, one of the things we, we said off <laughs> in, my, in my training was, you know, people, people would sort of, you know, um, um, you know poo-poo the whole uh, placebo effect, and we said, you know, the, the placebo effect is an effect, and, I mean, it's so well-known and, and so sort of powerful that this is the effect by which medic, new medications are compared when you talk about medication trials. So if you put somebody on a new medication, they're in a, you know, a research trial for eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever the duration might be, you can have one group of people getting a placebo and the other group of people actually getting the medication itself, and they're going to compare the effect. And the placebo group where people 
were less people depressed? Were more, did more people improve? Did they stop hearing voices? Did they stop uh, you know, their mania? Or did they have become less anxious? And if a drug's effect, if, if the effect in the drug group is the same as the effect in the placebo group, you, you basically say, drug no good. And a lot of pharmaceutical companies have gone to great lengths to hide those research studies that show that their medication is no better than a placebo. Right. So I want to make that clear. The placebos mean that there's no medicine in it, right? I mean, it's right. the idea that you're giving somebody a sugar pill or something that has right. no... Yeah, I think... It should that, not be helpful. Yeah. And yet the people who take this still get better. And they still get better. And that's what they mean by the placebo effect, right? right? And, the, yeah. and, the, and, the, and research and stuff. Yeah. And so the idea is that... It, and I think the question is, is that the power of the mind? In other words, yeah. the mind thinks I'm getting a medicine and it's helpful and it's going to make me better, and, uh, and therefore it, yeah. it works. And, and the thing I think that you said earlier was that whole idea that, um, well, I'll let you repeat it, but the, maybe they would have got better anyway. Go ahead. Say right, because yeah, one of the things is people talk about this placebo effect and maybe we should give people placebos all the time and not use a lot of these medications that are more toxic. Another idea around this is that even the placebo effect is then masking a natural progress or natural healing process. So maybe you're in this study for you know eight or twelve weeks, which is a pretty common length of a study, and you would have gotten better anyway on your own if we had just let you take nothing whatsoever. So is it the natural progress of us getting better anyway? A uh, very famous um, uh, physician, Sir William Osler, and it once described that the duty of the physician is to entertain the patient while they get better on their own. So there's that idea too that you're really nothing we're doing is helping. You know, you get the common cold, forget it, you got the cold. Uh, take care of your symptoms. You are not going to shorten the duration of the cold. You got it. You're going to have it for that many days or weeks. So maybe we're missing the whole point that uh, we get better on our own, or maybe again we're tapping into something by the very act of, of giving somebody something. Um, I read a couple of articles about shamanism, and one of the uh, sort of underlying principles of that is that I hold some kind of a magic or some kind of a, a, a potion, and that I have to care enough about you or think enough of you that I'm willing to share that magic with you. And so this very sort of act here of actually giving you something that has to do with a connection and allows you then to sort of feel real connected, a part of the social circle, and therefore you start to get better. Right. So whether it's a sugar pill or whether I write a prescription and I hand that to you, there's something very, uh, very human, uh, sort of say, sort of you know, tribal or evolutionary, about that connection and that whatever it is, uh, the placebo or a prescription, it's really just enacting that uh, uh, process is very deep in our evolution. Right, and I, I think it's also worth mentioning that you know, who volunteers to be in these studies. Uh, but let's just yeah. say hypothetically that th this is somebody who has the illness and, and they want to get better and they want to be in the study. You know, you'll see it in the paper sometimes. Anybody who's yeah. struggling with diabetes, we're testing a new drug, sign yeah. up, call us. You know, if you look at some of the Boston papers, you'll see it occasionally. Um, and I think that's somebody who's motivated to get better, somebody who's willing. And, you know, in AA, I, we, you know, in the treatment programs, you know, we would talk about the first, second, step, And so sometimes the first week is sort of getting them to admit that they have this chronic, sometimes fatal disease right. or illness. Which and is then, a big you know, breakthrough. They need to deal with it. Yeah. And, they, and so you say, okay, that. But then you'd follow that up by saying, but by the way, we have something that will help you get better. And, you know, in, the, in, the, you know, in AA jargon, it's the second step, came to believe. That yeah. you power grant yourself, you start to say. So the idea is that first you have to admit that you're sick and that you know things yeah. are pretty sort of a surrender. Yeah. yeah, but then you got to believe in something, and yeah. from that belief comes hope, yeah. and a belief that you can get better. And so you know, many an addict and alcoholic, if you talk to them about stopping using, you say, yeah. "Why don't you stop?" And they say, "I can't." Yeah, and they sort of accept that as a as a given. And I think one of the things that has to happen, and I think why detox in some ways was helpful is that yeah. you would actually get them to stop and then you would give them the hope and the belief yeah. that they could get better. And part of this is the power of... Yeah.